Hello, and welcome back once again. Uh, if you are in my class, congratulations on getting past midterm two. Uh, and if you ask me, all the good stuff is yet to come. Uh, if you're not in my class, then hey, buy my book, A Step-by-Step -Step Guide to the Principles of Microeconomics, uh, which will tell you how to solve all of these sorts of questions that you will come across in your Principles of Microeconomics class, uh, especially as they pertain to pricing power. Uh, and uh, today that's what we're going to be talking about is pricing power and in specific and specifically we're going to be talking today about monopoly all right so uh, why don't we just go ahead and get started so pricing power uh, what is pricing power so everything that we've done up to now has focused on competitive markets right competitive market is a market where every individual participant in the market is such a tiny little piece of that market uh, that you can basically just ignore them. They have no control uh, over the price of the good. Uh, it's sort of set for them by the market and they're just responding to it, right? They're just sort of afloat in the sea of the market and it is telling them which way to go, at least in terms of the price, right? They can respond to the price however they want, producing more or less. But that's not always the case. Uh, as I've said a number of times throughout the course, uh, many, many, Markets, especially markets today, are not particularly competitive, or at least there's some sort of limitation on the competition that they face. Uh, and when that happens, then we get what's called pricing power. And pricing power is simply the ability to set your own price. Instead of the market setting the price for you and you just sort of going along with it uh, and you saying, okay, here's the price, I can either produce more or I can produce less, but no matter what I do, that price is going to stay the same. Instead, you have some power. You are going to have the ability to choose. Well, do I want to be a kind of firm that's going to produce a whole lot of units at a very low price? Or am I going to want to produce very few units at a very high price? And that's going to be a, price, uh, a pricing decision that you have control over. Now that you have some form of pricing power, now that the competition against you is limited, uh, and that is really the key of, of what's going on here. Right? And a lot of markets are like this, as I mentioned, right? So a lot of the theories about competitive markets came about when a lot more markets were competitive, right? Talking about things like commodities, where everyone's selling really the same thing. Uh, and today, a lot of markets are less competitive. A lot of the things that we buy or a lot of the markets that we really pay attention to are things that have strong branding or have strong uh, technology uh, associated with them. And in those sorts of situations, it's a little bit harder to compete. And that's really what pricing power is all about. Uh, when you have some sort of limitation to competition. And now, we're going to go over a number of different ways in which pricing power can arise, but they do all really come back to that limitation on competition. That pricing power, the ability to set your own price, comes about when there is something that limits the ability of others to compete against you. Uh, there's gotta be some sort of barrier to entry. Right? Think about the story that we told with competitive markets. Imagine that you're in a competitive market and you're making a profit, okay? What did we say was gonna happen if you're making a profit? Well, you can make a profit for a certain period of time, right? You can set the price above uh, the, uh, the you know, zero profit point, but what's gonna happen? That profit is going to entice other people to come in and compete against you. That's going to shift the supply curve to the right. That's going to drop the price and eventually you're going to get back down to that zero profit point. And pricing power is all about something stopping that last step, something stopping the fact that other people want to come in and compete against you, right? You're making a profit. Your price is above the zero profit point. Everybody around you is looking at you. They're saying, oh, I wish I had some of that and they wanna come in and compete against you, get a little bit of that profit, but they can't. There's something stopping them. And there are a number of things that could be stopping them. Let's go into what those things could be. So here are the five things. We're gonna list them out and then we're gonna go through each one of them in detail. The first one is exclusive control over important inputs. The second is patents and copyrights. The third is limited licensing. The fourth is economies of scale, also known as natural monopolies. And finally, we have network economies or network goods. So let's talk about what each of these things are. So first of all, exclusive control over important inputs. So we've talked a lot about how the fact that on the supply side of the market, everything really is about the production process. And what is the production process? It's when you take some sort of input and you do something to it, you transform it in some way, and you end up with an output that you can sell. And in order to do this, in order to be a part of this process at all, you need to have those inputs, right? 
So what happens if you do not have access to those inputs? You simply do not have the ability to buy the inputs that you need in order to compete in this market. Well, then you can't compete in the market, right? So if some company, say, has bought up control over all of one of the important inputs to this market, then there's simply no way to compete against them. So one example of this is real estate. If you're in a city where a lot of the real estate is owned by one person, that person might be able to use some of their pricing power. Uh, they might be able to get some sort of profit. And other people would say, hey, I'd love to compete against this person. I'd really love to be in the market for real estate in this city. Well, who can I get that real estate from so I can be in the market? Uh, uh, you can't, there's nobody to buy it from, right? Because this person controls all of the market. Another good example of this is with diamonds. Uh, the De Beers company owns a significant fraction of the world's diamond mines. And so if you look at the price of a diamond, you think, hey, I bet I could mine diamonds cheaper than that and sell them cheaper than that and compete with De Beers. You might think, okay, well, that's great. Maybe I'll get some of those profits. But then you realize, well, how can I actually get my hands on some diamonds? They have all the diamond mines. There's simply no way that you have access to getting those diamonds so that you could sell them on the market. This is a limitation to your ability to compete, right? It limits competition for De Beers, which allows De Beers to have pricing power. Another example of this that may be a little bit less dire uh, is soap. So this might be a surprise to you, but uh, the invention of hand pumped soap where you would go into your bathroom and you would have a little uh, bottle of soap that you could get out with a pump is actually relatively new. Uh, it came about in the 1980s. It's that recent. Uh, and it was really an invention uh, or at least a popularization by a company Soft Soap, which you may have heard of. Okay. And uh, they came up with this idea in the 80s and they focus grouped it and everybody loved it. Everybody loved the idea of getting some hand pumped soap rather than some of the things that you used to have to do of, you know, going into a public bathroom and there's a bar of soap or maybe they have a little dispenser that gives you some little dry soap pellets that you can then wash your hands with. Uh, no, this was a lot better than any of those options and everybody knew it. But soft soap knew, well, hold on a minute. If we go to market with this, everyone else is just going to steal our idea and they're going to compete against us. And then because they're big, big soap companies and we're just this little startup, they're going to win and we're going to be pushed out of the market. So what can we do? Well, maybe we would like to have some pricing power. We want to have a limit on the amount of people that can compete with us. So let's take control, exclusive control over an important input. So here's what they did. They went to the only factories in the country that made the particular kinds of hand pumps that you'd need to dispense the soap, right? What do you need to produce a bottle of hand pumped soap? Well, you need a bottle, you need some soap, and you need a hand pump. If nobody else can get access to that hand pump, they can't compete against you. So they went to these factories and they bought out their entire production line for several years, which meant that if anybody else wanted to compete against them, they would have to basically start their own factory or wait for the contract that Soft Soap had to expire. So they did this, they bought out the whole production line, they went to market, all these other companies, uh, the soap, soap companies wanted to compete against them, they saw what a great idea it was, but they couldn't compete. They could not get their hands on any pumps. And so the soft soap had a, uh, uh, has some pricing power in this market, at least until that, uh, their, their contracts expired. They grew very quickly, and in the end they were acquired by, I believe, Dial for something like $4 billion. So that's one way in which you can get some pricing power to have control over an input. That means that nobody else is gonna be able to produce this good. Uh, you could also have a patent or a copyright. This is an example of pricing power that is granted by the government. So we're all familiar, I hope, with the idea, the general idea of patents and copyrights. Uh, so if you develop something new, either you invent something new for a patent uh, or you develop some sort of new intellectual property, you get a copyright. And when you do this, the government says, all right, you've developed this new thing as sort of a reward for developing something new. We are going to grant you the exclusive right to sell this thing for a limited period of time. Right? You get a patent on some new drug, say, uh, and you have the exclusive right to sell that drug for about 10 years. Uh, you develop some new intellectual property. You write a book. You develop a cartoon character. And you can have the right to that cartoon character for something like 75 years, something ridiculous like that. Uh, and so that means that they have the only right to actually be able to compete in that market, right? When somebody comes out with a new movie, you know, they, came, they just came out with Black Panther as I filmed this, right? Uh, now nobody else is allowed to take that movie and sell it, right? 
Marvel is the only one that has the right to lease that film out to theaters or to sell it on DVD. If you tried to create your own Black Panther DVDs, the government would come after you, right? Uh, and so that means that there's a limitation to competition. You can't just observe that they're selling the Blu-rays for quite a bit of money and decide, hey, I could probably sell it for cheaper and come in and, under and, and, and uh, cut their price uh, because there's this limitation on your ability to compete in this market. Uh, now, of course, patents and copyrights do expire. Uh, so, uh, of course, you know, drug patent, uh, dr drug copy, or drug patents, sorry, uh, drug patents expire after about 10 years. So you develop a new drug, you have about 10 years to uh, be the sole provider of that drug. And then barring some particular loopholes that you could take advantage of, at that point, it becomes legal for other people to make generic versions of the drug. Copyrights also expire eventually. So for example, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Sherlock Holmes was a character developed by Arthur Conan Doyle quite a long time ago. And after a while, the government said, all right, you've had Arthur Conan Doyle, you've had the right, the sole right to produce books about this character for long enough. Uh, now it is in the public domain and anybody can make things about it. So now we have four different uh, currently running to different degrees, uh, Sherlock Holmes variants. And I'm probably leaving out quite a few. Uh, of course, while it's still under copyright, you can't do that, right? You cannot compete against Walt Disney and make your own Mickey Mouse cartoon, uh, at least for now. Uh, Mickey Mouse is in fact an interesting example because uh, the last time that the patent, uh, uh, the copyright length changed was when, Mickey, was when Mickey Mouse was just about to come up for going into the public domain. It had been developed long enough ago that uh, time had passed and on the, under the current law, Mickey Mouse was about to become public domain. Uh, Disney lobbied pretty heavily to make that not the case anymore, and the copyright law, uh, time length was expanded. Uh, that is actually coming up to a limit again. In uh, several years, Mickey Mouse will once again be on track to enter the public domain, and as of right now, as of this filming, Disney does not appear to be putting that much effort into stopping it. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Maybe in a couple years you'll be able to perfectly legally sell your own bootleg merchandise Mickey Mouse hats. Why not? Next up, limited licensing. So limited licensing is, is happens whenever a government says, okay, uh, if you want to be in this business, you need to have a license, all right? Uh, and we're going to limit the number of licenses that are available in some way, either by literally saying we're only going to allow this many licenses to exist or saying something like these licenses, there can be as many as you want, but they're going to be super, super expensive. So. Uh, when this happens, right, imagine, let's say that uh, you're talking about a license to do something like cut hair, okay? Uh, and you realize that people who are cutting hair are making a good profit. You want to come in and compete against them. You want to cut hair as well. Uh, but it's going to cost you a whole lot of money in order to enter that market because you need to get the license. Even if you already know how to cut hair, it's going to cost you money to enter the market. That is going to be a barrier to entry. It's going to limit competition in that market and it's going to keep you from competing and it's going to allow the people who are currently in the market to have some amount of pricing power. Now there are lots of examples of this, right? The medieval guild system worked this way uh, where a lot of occupations like blacksmithing, if you wanted to enter, you had to enter through the formal guild system. Uh, if you wanted to set up your own black, blacksmith shop without the formal approval of one of these guilds, well, they might just burn your house down. Uh, and so that would be an example of some limited licensing. It enforces a limitation on the number of people who can compete because you have to come in through a specific way. Uh, more modern examples, one is liquor licenses. Uh, a lot of places will, you know, if you want to sell liquor in your restaurant or bar, you have to get a particular license to do so. And a lot of places, usually with the intention of specifically limiting the access to liquor, uh, will limit the number of licenses that are available in total. Now this means that when people want to buy more liquor than there are currently licensed places available to do so, the price of those liquor licenses is going to go way, way up. And in fact, that has happened, right? If you want to open up a restaurant or a bar that sells liquor, you will often have to spend tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, just to get that license that allows you to compete in the market. Obviously, that limits the amount of competition in the market and, keeps the and, make and allows the uh, bars and restaurants that do have the license to... Uh, uh, have pricing power. Another one that actually seems to be changing is taxi cabs. Uh, so a lot of cities, uh, a very good example being New York City, have a, a taxi cab medallion system. If you want to drive a taxi cab, you are required to buy what's called a taxi medallion. This is basically a license to run a cab. 
Uh, now, there's a limited number of these uh, taxi cab medallions, which means that they got very, very expensive. As the number of people in New York City grew faster than the number of medallions, the demand for taxi cabs got really, really strong. And so it became very lucrative to run a taxi. And so the price of a, a medallion, just the right to run a single cab, could go up to a million dollars, which is pretty crazy. And we can see what sort of effect this has because we know what happens at this point if you then take away that restriction. What happened when Uber came into play, right? When Uber and Lyft became a thing, uh, they basically skirted this tax cab medallion law uh, and that increased the amount of competition. It removed a barrier to entry. Now, if you wanna compete with a taxi cab, you don't have to buy a medallion. You can just take your car out and put an Uber sticker on it and download the app. Uh, this has basically made the price of a medallion crash uh, pretty low and it has removed the pricing power. It has removed the barrier to entry for a lot of, uh, uh, the, for, the, for basically the taxi cab market. Uh, as sort of an aside here, uh, this makes you think, well, okay, Uber and Lyft, uh, whether this is a good thing or not that they exist, and I think it's probably a good thing uh, overall, they're definitely illegal. Uh, and this is, it's fun because nobody really talks about it, but they're just basically two giant illegal companies that everyone just seems to be pretty cool with. Uh, so you can, you can uh, enjoy that or not. All right, next up as a determinant of pricing power, we have economies of scale or natural monopolies. Uh, now, we have a general idea that, you know, the bigger your operation gets, you might be able to get some returns to scale, right? You, you know, you get bigger machines that are more efficient, you do whatever. But in the cases of some goods, those returns to scale are so huge that the average cost, remember how we drew an average cost, it sort of had a cup shape, it went down and then went back up? In some goods cases, it just goes down. It never comes back up. Basically, this sort of thing happens when you have startup costs that are really, really high, but then once you've built the thing, it's really, really cheap to use. A good example of this is a sewer system, right? Building a sewer system is incredibly expensive, right? You have to dig up all the city streets, you gotta put in a bunch of tunnels there, it's a huge construction project. But once it's in place, the cost of, you know, expanding the use of that sewer is pretty low, right? Just letting people use the sewer is fairly cheap. And so when you have a good like this, where it's pretty much all startup cost, and the average cost is going down and down and down, never really starts going back up again. Uh, what it means is that this good is gonna be most efficiently produced by a single provider, right? Let's think about why this is. Let's, let's draw a picture of what this might look like. So we're gonna draw a picture that's a whole lot like uh, what we had before, but this time we're gonna have our marginal cost being flat. And the reason for that is we're basically saying, okay, once it's established, it's not very expensive to use and it doesn't really get more expensive. It's just gonna be flat. Now, we're also gonna put in our average cost and our average cost is gonna go down, it's gonna slope down and it's, it's gonna curve. It's never really gonna quite hit marginal cost. Remember, average cost starts going up again once it hits marginal cost, but that's never ever gonna happen, at least not at the range that we're looking at. Now, if we have a situation like this, let's imagine what would happen if we had this good produced by one firm as opposed to two. So let's say that in this market, the number of units that people are gonna consume is gonna be 100. So I'm gonna put on here 100. Okay, I'm gonna follow that up. And I can see on the average cost, sort of what my average cost of production is to make 100 units. Now let's imagine that I took that company and I split it into two. So now instead of one firm making 100 units, I've got two firms making 50 units each. What is that gonna look like? Well, if I put a 50 on here, I follow that up and you can see that the average cost has gotten quite a bit higher. What this is basically saying is that it's more expensive to produce this good if you have more firms doing it. It's cheaper to have it all concentrated in one firm just because the returns to scale are so high. Let's consider this in the example of our sewers, okay? Basically what this is saying is that uh, in order to make it the sewer not run like a monopoly, you would need to have a second sewer system built right next to the first one, right? Just redundant, completely redundant, uh, just in order to be able to have two firms doing it. Now, obviously this is a really wasteful way to do things. It's much cheaper just to have there be one sewer system. Even if it's not competitive, it's a lot cheaper to run that way. It's more efficient. Uh, and so just building a whole second sewer system right next to the first one, just so you can let them compete with each other is way more costly 
than it needs to be. So this is what's called a natural monopoly. It's natural because it's the nature of the good itself that leads it to be a monopoly. It, it sort of inclines itself towards being a monopoly because that's the most efficient way to produce this good. Commonly, this sort of thing arises when we're talking about infrastructure or public works projects. Uh, I mentioned the cost of building a second sewer system. You can also imagine the cost of building a second electricity grid right next to the first one, serving the exact same houses, the exact same streets, just a second wire strung along the first one with a second set of poles only put in there because a second firm wanted to compete. It'd be clearly be very wasteful. And not only would it be really wasteful to do it this way, it would be really difficult to enter as a new competitor. Imagine you move to a town where there's already a sewer system and a power grid, right? And you think, hey, you know, I noticed that the sewer system and the power grid, they have a little bit of pricing power going on. They, they're probably making a profit. I want to make some of that profit, so here's what I'll do. I'll build a second sewer system right next to the first one. I'll build a second power grid right next to the first one. Now, the problem here is that in order to do this, you'd need to expend a whole lot of money just to get started. And unless you build one that's as big as theirs, they're going to be able to operate theirs more cheaply than you, which means that coming in as the new small startup, you're not actually going to be less efficient than the big one. And so they're going to be able to outcompete you on cost and the fact that you're just sort of being silly. Lastly, network economies. Uh, so this is an, another example of one that has to do with the nature of the good itself. And so, by the way, we sort of have five different determinants of pricing power here. The first one is exclusive control over an important input, right? That one's about what the company does to set itself up as being the only firm that can produce this thing. The next two we had were, limit, were uh, uh, patents and copyrights and limited licensing. These are both forms of which the government gives you basically the right to have some pricing power. The last two are natural monopolies and network economies or network goods. These are basically things that are intrinsic to the kind of good we're talking about itself. So different sources of pricing power coming from the firm, the way they set themselves up, the government, the way they grant pricing power to, to different firms, and the kind of good that it, that it is itself. All of these different things can lead to pricing power in different ways. So back to network goods or network economies. Uh, so network good is basically any kind of good where the value of the good itself is the fact that people use it. Okay, uh, So the fact that people use it, that basically what you're buying when you buy into the good is you're buying access to all of those other users that the good has. So a really good example of this is Facebook. Imagine that Facebook had no users on it and you were thinking about whether or not to set up an account. You wouldn't, right? Why would you bother to set up a Facebook account to talk with nobody? There'd be no point. Uh, and so Facebook is an example of a network good. The value of Facebook rises the more people join it, right? The value of Facebook itself uh, to you as a consumer is the fact that other people use it. Some other good examples of this, uh, Microsoft with Windows, right? Windows uh, owns a major majority share uh, of, the, uh, of the desktop market, right? Most, most computers have Windows on them. Uh, now, why is this, right? Well, net Windows and operating systems are examples of network goods. Well, imagine for a second that you are going to buy a desktop computer. Which one do you want to buy? Well, you want to buy the one that can run all the programs that you want. Okay. Well, now let's say that you're a software developer and you're going to develop some software. Which platform are you going to develop your software for? Well, you're going to develop your software for the one that has all the people using it. So if you're a consumer, you want to buy the one that all the software developers are writing for. And if you're a software developer, you want to buy the one that all the users are buying. So essentially, you know, this is a network good. To the consumers, it's valuable that software developers use it. And to the software developers, it's valuable that the users use it. So this is an example of a network good. And when we have a network good, the inclination is for everybody to choose the same option, right? Everybody to sort of gather at a single option. Now, why is this? Well, imagine for a second that you had two different alternatives. Uh, and one of them has more people than the other. Well, then obviously that one becomes the more valuable option. So you're going to choose this one too, and then it's going to get even bigger. And then everyone else is going to choose it too, and it's going to get even bigger, and then bigger, 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 bigger. Okay. So everyone sort of naturally inclines to the one that's already bigger, and everybody ends up choosing the same option. Uh, this is one reason why it's so hard to compete with Facebook, right? A lot of people have tried. Google has tried with Google+, and they failed tremendously, right? Because imagine, you're going to set up a social network account or you have a social network account on every platform and you're deciding which one to invest time in, 
if the whole value of the social network platform is the fact that other people use it, you're going to go ahead and keep using the Facebook one because it's bigger and you have access to more people, then you're going to use the Google Plus one. Right? It's just not as valuable to you because there are fewer people on it. Uh, and so it's just going to be really hard to compete with Facebook on those same lines, which you'll note the reason why all of the other social networks that have done really well do things that are very different from what Facebook does, right? Because if they're just trying to compete on Facebook, even if their product is much better, even if Google Plus was a lot better than Facebook, it would still be a lot worse than Facebook because not anybody, because nobody uses it. Whereas something like Twitter or Instagram, they're all very different kinds of products. And so they don't try to compete with Facebook in the same way, which is how they can be successful. Uh, and you can imagine, well, we already had the story about how this is going to lead to everybody choosing the same option. It's also going to mean it's going to be very hard to be a new entrant. If Facebook is already really huge and you want to come in and compete as the little guy, not only do you have to have a better product than Facebook in order to get people to use yours, but you have to compete with the fact that everybody else is already on Facebook. It's going to be really, really hard to convince somebody to use your product when there's nobody on it. It's just a really big barrier to overcome. Your product is intrinsically less valuable than Facebook because it does not have the same user base. All right, so we've gone over our determinants of pricing power. The next thing to do is to figure out what's going to happen. Now that we have pricing power, what is the firm that has the pricing power going to do with its power? So the basic question that we're going to ask is, what are these firms actually going to do? We know that they have control over their price and they have control over their quantity. So how are they going to choose their price and their quantity? And the question that we're answering here is basically, how do these firms maximize their profit? Because just like the firms in the competitive market, that's what they're trying to do is maximize their profit. So how are they going to do it? So we're basically going to use a model that's very similar to the competitive market model that we already had. See, there is a point here that we are building on top of the model that we already had. There's a reason why you learned it in the first place. The main distinction that we're going to have between the competitive market model and the monopoly model is that in the competitive market model, when we looked at the demand curve that the firm faced, it was completely flat, right? They had no control over the price. No matter what quantity they chose, they always got the same price. But now you do have control over the price. You can choose to have a low price and a high quantity or high price and a low quantity, which means that the monopoly firm is going to face a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. Now we are going to be specifically talking about monopoly firms here, but a lot of this logic is going to extend to other kinds of firms that have pricing power. A monopoly firm, by the way, is when you just have one firm uh, in the market. They're the only one in the market because there's only one. It becomes a little bit simpler to think about. So let's think about it. So we're going to have a downward sloping demand curve and let's draw this out. Okay. So we're going to start out with the exact same setup that we had for our competitive market. We're going to have our marginal cost curve looks just the same. We're going to have our average cost curve and it's going to be just the same. It's going to be that cup shape, right? That downward sloping only part was just for natural monopolies for other monopolies. It's going to look the same as it used to. Now we're going to put on top of this, our downward sloping demand curve. There it is. And then I'm going to add one more curve. We're not quite done. And that extra curve that I'm going to add is marginal revenue and marginal revenue is going to be below demand and it's going to slope down more quickly than demand. So what is marginal revenue here and why did I put it on there? So let's think about this for a second. So in the past, when we worked with competitive firms, we knew that we wanted to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost in order to maximize our profit. But because we were a competitive firm and we had no control over the price, every time we sold another unit of the good, we got paid the price, which meant that our marginal revenue simply by definition was the price. And so instead of using marginal revenue equals marginal cost, we just used price equals marginal cost, but no more. That now the marginal revenue and the price are actually going to be two different things. And let me show you why that is. Let's start by looking at total revenue. Total revenue is price times quantity, right? It's the number of units that you sell times the price that you sell them at. Now, what happens when you increase quantity? What happens to total revenue when you increase the quantity, right? That's what we're asking when we ask what is marginal revenue. So we increase the quantity uh, and we're going to sell that additional quantity at the price. Great. We just added the price to our revenue. However, 
In order to sell this additional unit, we had to lower the price. Now, why is this? Well, before we raise the quantity, before we increase the quantity, we were already charging the maximum price that we could possibly get in order to sell that many units. So if we want to sell even more units than that, we're going to have to sweeten the deal. We're going to have to lower the price a little bit. So the price that we're going to get paid for selling that additional unit is going to be a little bit lower than the price that we just had. Okay, well, fine. We're going to get paid a little bit less than the price that we already had. But also, in order to do this, because we're only charging one price to the whole market, we're going to have to lower the price on every unit that we were selling. So if we were selling, say, 10 units at a price of $9, and we wanted to sell that 11th unit, well, we might have to lower the price from 9 to 8 for every single unit that we sold. So we would get paid an additional eight for selling that extra unit, right, at that new price of eight, but also we would lose out on all the money that we could have made, right, because instead of selling those, those first 10 units at nine, instead we're selling them at eight, and that's a loss. So you have to combine those two things together, the gain from selling the additional unit and the loss from lowering the price on all the other units to come at your marginal revenue. And because there's that gain of the price minus some loss of some size, the total margin, the, the marginal revenue that we end up with is going to be lower than the price because we start with the price and then we subtract something. So the marginal revenue is going to be different from the price and specifically it's going to be lower than the price. So as we draw it on the graph, it's going to be lower than the price always and it's going to slope down more quickly than the price. Uh, in particular, uh, the slope of the marginal revenue curve is going to be double the slope of the demand curve. Uh, just memorize that for now. If you want to know why that is, look in the book or you can do some calculus and figure it out for yourself. Uh, but that's just a reminder for you right there. The slope of marginal revenue is double the slope of demand. So for example, if the, if the demand curve was price equals 50 minus 2Q, then the marginal revenue curve would be 50 minus 4Q, right? The 50 stays the same, the slope, the two, just gets doubled. That's it. That's how you get from a demand curve to a marginal revenue curve. So we've got these four curves on there. Now we want to be able to maximize our profit. And we're going to follow basically the exact same steps that we did with the competitive firm. And let's draw these steps out. So step number one, is we're going to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and this is going to give us our quantity i'm going to call it qm uh, for the monopoly quantity right this is exactly what we did in the competitive market where there we set price equal to marginal cost but really what we were doing was setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and that so we're setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost here too because we know that's how you maximize your profit so i'm going to put a dot here where marginal cost and marginal revenue meet I'm going to follow that down, and that's going to give me my quantity, QM, monopoly quantity. Next, step two. We know what quantity we want to set. What price are we going to set? Well, basically, we want to charge the highest possible price that we can, get the most money that we can, while still selling this many units. So the question is, well, how much are you willing to pay? How much is the market willing to pay per unit in order to buy this many units? So all we got to do... That's a question for the demand curve. Hey, demand curve, how much are you willing to pay for this many units? So we're going to ask the demand curve. We're going to take this quantity. We're going to plug QM into the demand, and that will give us our price. I'm going to call that PM for monopoly price. So that's the step that we're doing. In terms of the graph, how it works is we're taking our quantity. We're following it up until we hit the demand curve, and then follow that over to get to the price. PM. Okay, that's step number two. Step number three, this is going to look very similar to the competitive market. We're going to plug QM into our average cost curve, and that's going to give us our average cost, just the same as it was for the competitive market, right? Just follow our QM until we get to average cost, follow that over, and that gives us our AC. And then finally, step four, we can get profit from quantity times price minus average cost, just as we do. And just as we do on this graph, we already have our box sort of formed out. We have a width on this box of Q and we have a height of price 
minus average cost. So I'm just gonna go ahead and shade that in, and that is our profit. And that's, how, that's it, that's really it. It's the exact same steps as in the competitive market, except now we're working with marginal revenue instead of just taking the price as given, and we're setting the price using the demand curve. Everything else is exactly the same. Now let's take a look at what we have here. So we have this nice profit, and importantly, remember, we have a barrier to entry. We have something that's limiting competition. If this were the competitive market, other firms would come in and they would compete against us, which would drive the price down and make this profit go away. But because we're a monopoly, because there's something keeping those firms out, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna be sitting nice and pretty with our nice big profit for quite a while. All right, so uh, we've got these steps. We have, we've got the steps to follow. We have our way of doing it on the graph. Let's also do it mathematically as long as we're at it. Uh, so let's go ahead and have some curves. I mean, let's just go ahead and say that our marginal cost is 2Q. Our average cost is 100 divided by Q plus Q. Our demand is price equals 100 minus Q. Our marginal revenue is 100 minus 2Q. Remember, uh, the, demand, the marginal revenue curve is just what you get when you take the price, uh, sorry, take the demand curve and you double the slope on Q. Here the slope on Q was one, now it's two. All right. So. We're gonna follow the exact same steps. We're just gonna do it with equations instead. So step number one, set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. All right, so we have marginal revenue, which is 100 minus 2Q. We're gonna set that equal to marginal cost, which is 2Q. Add 2Q to either side, we get 100 equals 4Q. Divide by four, we get 25 equals QM. That's our monopoly quantity. Step two, we're gonna take that quantity, we're gonna say, hey, demand curve, what are you willing to pay for this? We're gonna ask the demand curve, so we're just gonna plug this 25 into our demand curve. And our price, PM, is going to be 100 minus our Q, which is 25, so our price is 75. Next, we're gonna plug this into average cost and see what we can get there. So our average cost is 100 divided by Q, which is 25 plus Q, which is 25, that's gonna give us 25 plus four, or 29. And then finally, our profit. Our profit is going to be uh, quantity times price minus average cost, which is going to be 25 times 75 minus 29. Uh, and you know what? We could calculate that out. Pull out your calculator, but there's no need to. That's the answer right there, okay? And that's basically how you follow the exact same steps as we would on the graph, right? We're just doing it in, al in you know, algebraic form. We can even label these numbers on the graph if we want to. We could put in 75 where the price is here. We could put in 29 where the average cost is. We could put in 25 where the quantity is. All right, so we've got our way of figuring out where pricing power comes from. We know what pricing power is, right? It's this limitation on competition that gives you the ability to set your own price without losing all your customers. Uh, we've got this way of doing it mathematically and graphically, figuring out how firms maximize their profits under the ability to, to, to uh, choose their own prices, to have some pricing power. We know that it's going to generate profits that don't go away in the long run. We also happen to know that because these profits don't go away in the long run, this means that business people are going to seek out these sorts of situations where they have pricing power. Right? A lot of you are probably in business majors or interested in business. You might have heard advice to do things like differentiate or set yourselves apart or brand. These are all attempts to set up pricing power by making it so that other people can't compete against you quite as easily. Right? If you have a brand as strong as, say, Coca-Cola, it makes it difficult for other soda companies to compete against you in the same way. Uh, now, this is, of course, very good for you as a business person. It means that you're going to get these nice profits that will not go away in the long run. Uh, but it also means that, you know, there's going to be some inefficiency, right? We're going to end up with a dead weight loss. Well, why is that? Well, think about what we were doing here. We're basically setting the price a little bit higher than maybe it should be at the efficient level uh, and setting the quantity a little bit lower than it should be at the efficient level. This improves our profits, but it sort of leaves some people out in the cold. In particular, if we look at our graph, our dead weight loss area is going to be this area right here between marginal cost and demand between the 
quantity that we chose and what we're going to call the efficient quantity. I'm going to call that Q star. That's where demand and marginal cost meet. That's our deadweight loss. Now, why is it deadweight loss? This is basically surplus that we are giving up because this firm has pricing power. So look at this for a second. So imagine that you are on this graph right here. And let's say that you are this person right here on the demand curve. Now, you value this good, whatever good that this, that this monopolist is selling, at a certain amount. And the monopolist could produce it for you at a much lower cost. If they made it for you and they sold it to you, you'd be better off and they'd be better off. But they've chosen a quantity too low and a price too high to get you to do this, right? The price is higher than you are willing to pay. Basically, they could make both of you better off by selling you the good. But in order to sell it to you, they'd have to lower the price, right? Because right now their price is higher than you're willing to pay. And by lowering the price to the point where you're willing to buy it, they would lose so much money on the goods that they're already selling that it becomes not worth it to them. So we end up with this dead weight loss. This efficient quantity, by the way, if you're interested in finding it, comes about if we do set price equal to marginal cost. Right? So in this case, with, the, with our equation, if we were to set 100 minus Q, right, because our price is coming from the demand curve, equal to our marginal cost of 2Q, right? And we solve this out, we get 100 equals 3Q, or about 33 and a third is equal to Q. So the efficient quantity here is 33.3, but the profit maximizing quantity is only 25. That is eight and a third units that should be produced if, it, if this were being efficient, but in fact is not. And this is a standard result that you get that the monopoly will produce quantities that are too low and prices that are too high compared to the efficient output of the market. Right? All those nice things that we said about the competitive market, about how it produces efficient results, they start to fall apart as soon as you introduce pricing power into the mix. So with all of that said, let's start thinking about how we can apply this to real life. And in particular, we're talking about monopolies where there's only one firm in the market. And these are actually kind of rare in real life. Now, there are a lot of them that are sort of government controlled, right? The government has a lot of monopolies. There's really only one post office. There's one fire department. There's one police department. And there's, you know, security offices and other, and or sorry, security uh, guards and there's, uh, you know, FedEx or whatever, but those are relatively small compared to the government's basically a monopoly. Uh, but uh, in the private sector, there's really not a lot of monopolies. Usually there's a, one firm that's very, very big, but there are actually other competitors. So it's not really literally just one firm in the market. Uh, but I did find one good example in the private sector that is a true monopoly, and it is serious. XM Radio. Uh, now, if you're not familiar, uh, the Sirius XM is a satellite radio company. What they do is they sell you a satellite radio box. Uh, it's sort of like a little box that goes in your car and it plays the radio, sort of like you play over the radio in your car, uh, except it's a special premium set of channels. You get a whole bunch of channels and they play, you know, there's like a whole channel that's just one artist and all that sort of thing. Uh, now, they did not used to be a monopoly. Uh, it used to be the case that there was XM radio and there was Sirius radio. In 2001, XM radio launched a satellite radio service with a subscription fee. Uh, and then in 2002, Sirius satellite radio launched its competing service. Uh, and for a lot of years, they had a lot of trouble making any sort of profit. Right? They're competing against each other. That pushes the prices down, the fact that there is competition. Uh, and even though they had millions and millions of subscribers and they had some very exclusive content that makes it a little bit difficult to compete, right? There is a barrier to entry here. There is a limit on competition, but it could be even more limited. It could be just a monopoly. Uh, and both of the firms basically had their prices pushed down by the fact that there was some form of competition. You can imagine both of them maybe cost $10 a month and XM is like, geez, we're not really making any money. Let's start charging 12 bucks a month. Well, then suddenly everyone's just going to sort of filter over and get serious instead. That's no good for XM. So in 2008, the two companies merged. They merged together. Now, the reason why they would want to merge is that by merging, it means there's less competition in the market. They don't have to compete against each other anymore. There's just one firm and they can set whatever price they want, conditional on the demand of the market. Uh, and uh, this would, of course, let them raise prices on their subscribers. Now. The government knew that they was, were going to raise prices on subscribers and the government tends to frown on that sort of thing. So what they did is they approved the merger. Governments have to approve large mergers like this, but they stipulated that 
well, if you're going to merge, you're not allowed to raise your prices for three years. They said, okay, fine, all right. So they merged, they continued to lose money at their low prices for about three years, and then as soon as the three years was over, suddenly that extreme level of pricing power really kicked into gear. They raised their prices and they started becoming profitable, and they are, of course, a 100% monopoly. As far as I know, there's no other satellite radio service. Uh, so, in this case, uh, we can think about, well, where did this monopoly come from? Where, which of those five determinants of pricing power did we end up with? And I think a lot of the thing to do here is the fact that there really is a very large fixed cost and a very low uh, marginal cost after that. This is sort of a natural monopoly. Uh, you can imagine, you know, you know, you don't really need to use two services, two satellite subscription services at once. And the costs are really all in creating the shows and setting up the whole network in the first place. After that, it's pretty cheap to let people use it. This is not that far off from what we were talking about with artificially scarce goods before, but in this case, it sort of trends things towards being a monopoly. Uh, and given that we have this monopoly, and you know, and in this case, we might think this might have actually been a good thing that's a monopoly, right? If when it was not a monopoly, nobody was making any money, and it seems inevitable that they probably both would have gone out of business, and then nobody would have had satellite radio at all. So it's probably good that they managed to become a monopoly uh, and raise their prices so that they could survive. But that might be a special case where if it's not a monopoly, it's going to fall apart. And so whenever we do see a monopoly, we want to think, well, okay, what do we think about the existence of this monopoly? Is it a good thing uh, or is it a bad thing? And if it's a bad thing, how bad is it? And so we want to ask some questions. So let's ask some questions about a given monopoly that you know, are based on the things that we've learned about pricing power so far. So first thing we can ask about, about a monopoly is why is it a monopoly, right? Where did the firm get its pricing power? Second, is it naturally a monopoly? Is it a natural monopoly? Is it this good always going to end up being constructed as a monopoly? Last, set, uh, third, we can ask how much do prices rise? We know that when you have pricing power, you tend to put prices that are too high and quantities that are too low. So do we actually see this happening and how much? And lastly, should we do anything about it, right? We have some governmental power to uh, restrict monopolies. Should we be worried about this particular monopoly? And is that justification to do anything about it? So let's take an example of Google. So Google is not a pure monopoly, right? There's very few actual pure monopolies in the private sector. Uh, but economists tend to refer to any market where one firm has like a really, really big chunk of the market as a monopoly anyway. And in Google's case, they have about 70% of search volume, which is pretty big. They have a really big chunk of internet advertising revenue, and they're basically a monopoly in both of those spaces. So uh, we can ask all these questions about Google in particular. And uh, as I film this, I'm recognizing that this part of the lecture might go out of date uh, with some speed. But keep in mind uh, that when I wrote this, it made a little bit of sense. So first of all, where did this firm get its pricing power? So it's not like there's really a whole lot of network externality or uh, network externalities or goods uh, to do with search or ads. There's no real reason why everybody would need to choose the same ad platform. There's no government sanctioned monopoly going on here, really. Uh, you know, they might have some sort of protection on their search algorithm, but anybody else could make their own search algorithm as well. Uh, there's not really huge startup costs. If you've taken a programming class, you could build your own search engine or your own ad platform. It might not be as good as theirs, but you can do it. Uh, and that's not very much startup cost at all. Very likely, uh, where I think their monopoly power came from was technological superiority, which is sort of a form of controlling an input, right? If, if you have the best technology and nobody else can figure out how to copy it, that's basically denying everybody else an important input to compete with you. Uh, I happen to be old enough to remember the era before Google as a search engine existed, uh, and then it came out. And then search engines basically went from being a thing that was like, oh, this doesn't work, to, oh, this works really well. They were just much better than anything else that was out there on the market. And they managed to take that technological superiority that they had, uh, both in the search and ad spaces, and use it to build a monopoly and take over a giant share of the market. So that's probably where their, tech, their, uh, their pricing power came from. Uh, is this necessarily a monopoly? Probably not. This is probably not a natural monopoly, right? It's not like there's really any sort of efficiency gains to be had by concentrating all search or ads in one area. Question three, how much do prices rise and do prices rise, right? We can ask, well, are, is Google using their power as a monopolist or a near monopolist to raise their prices? Now, in the case 
uh, where we actually do have some competitors, it makes it a little bit easier to compare because we can just ask how much more expensive is Google than the alternatives. And it does look like for similar ads, Google does tend to charge 50 to 100% more than its rivals, Bing and Yahoo. Uh, it's able to do this because it has that pricing power. It can raise its prices above everybody else's and still keep some of its consumers because it has pricing power. It has that ability to do so. Another sort of hint that Google has pricing power is the fact that they have a lot of profits uh, and really excess profits above what you might expect from somebody who just ran a competitive ad or search platform. Uh, you know all the cool stuff that Google does. They develop self-driving cars and they have cool glasses and they do whatever. Uh, they can do that. They can afford to do that because they get all of these additional profits that don't seem to be going away, just like we would predict in our monopoly model. Lastly, should we do anything about this monopoly? Well, this one's a complicated one, uh, especially in Google's case, because they're not really just in the search and ad space. And you might be worried about their ability to use their uh, leverage and monopoly status to influence other areas. But in the particular case of search and ad, I suspect that it's probably not a huge issue, right? They're resting their pricing power on technological superiority. And they certainly had technological superiority when they debuted. But nowadays, other search engines and ad platforms are about as good as Google's are, right? Google might be a little bit better, but it's not as much better as it used to be. So we would expect that to the extent that they used to have pricing power, that should probably be starting to dissipate as people go to their competitors that might be cheaper uh, and, and have similar uh, products of similar quality. And we do, in fact, seem to be seeing this happening. Google's market share in both of those areas has been dropping over time. Uh, so it seems like they are, in fact, losing more and more of that pricing power and more and more of that market share. So in the case of Google, at least when it comes to ads and search, it seems like the monopoly problem might fix itself. Uh, now, that is not going to be the case in every monopoly you might think of, but it's good to go through these questions and start to think about what's actually going on here. So to sort of recap everything, pricing power comes when competition is limited in some way. There are lots of ways in which this can happen. A firm can set itself up to have the only source of inputs. The government could impose patents or copyrights or limited licensing. Uh, or the good itself could be a good that lends itself to naturally being a monopoly or having some sort of network uh, economy. Uh, firms are then going to take their pricing power and maximize their profit by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. When they do this, the price is going to be above marginal cost, right? The demand curve uh, is going to be downward sloping, but the marginal revenue curve is going to be lower than the demand curve and even more downward sloping. Remember, that marginal cost is going to come from where marginal revenue hits marginal cost, uh, which is going to be down here, and we're going to go up to get to the demand curve where we find price. Since we have to go up, we know that we're going to end up with a price that is above marginal cost. This is going to end up giving us prices that are higher than is efficient and quantities that are lower than is efficient. We're going to get a little bit of a dead weight loss, which is not going to be too nice. Uh, and we're going to end up with some pretty high prices, or sorry, some pretty good profits that are not going to go away in the long run, which means that firms are going to seek these pricing power situations, uh, which means that they're going to basically be seeking out situations that are a little bit inefficient, which is going to be nice for them, but not so nice for society. All right, that's it. Uh, I will see you next time when we will go more into other forms of pricing power and other structures that the market could take besides monopolies. Hope to see you then. Thank you very much.